September 29th, 1939. It is the capital of Poland and thus obviously the biggest prize in the twin Soviet and German invasions. And this week, Warsaw Falls. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, surprising pretty much the entire world, the Soviet Union invaded Poland. Their excuse for this was to protect people like the Ukrainians from possible German aggression. Germany was still in the process of its own Polish invasion, which began September 1st, although Germany and the Soviets had secretly agreed before that to divide Poland between them. Hitler gave the order to begin euthanizing the insane in Germany, but in the conquered territory, the German army was butting heads with the SS battalions and their crimes against humanity. They continue this week. As for the SS terror campaign of police and security in the conquered territory, this week, as the German police forces are consolidated into the Reich main security office under his control, Reinhard Heydrich reports that of the Polish upper classes in that territory, a maximum of 3% is still present. Present means alive, according to Martin Gilbert. Many thousands of doctors, priests, teachers, businessmen, and the like have been by now rounded up and killed. Gilbert says that in one diocese, two-thirds of the nearly 700 priests have been arrested, and 214 of them have been shot. And the Germans continue taking Polish territory. Army Group South is closing in to the south and west of Warsaw. The 25th becomes known to the locals as Black Monday, when 1,200 aircraft attack the city. But still, it holds out, though the bombing takes its toll. The fire brigade cannot hope to handle all the fires. Poland Betrayed says that on just the 22nd, there are around 500 fires burning simultaneously. The Warsaw Waterworks is bombed, so the firemen soon find themselves without water for their hoses and are reduced to throwing sand on the flames. By the 26th, with water and electricity cut and ammunition and medical supplies running low, a civilian delegation asks Army Warsaw General Julius Rommel to surrender. He sends envoys to the Germans and they agree to an end to hostilities at 2 p.m. the 27th. Polish troops are to pull back beyond a demarcation line. On the 29th, 140,000 soldiers leave the city and are taken prisoners of war. So Warsaw has fallen. For three days though, the Germans do not enter the city. Who would want to enter a city with no light and no water filled with the wounded and the dead? Elsewhere, resistance continues, even as refugees choke the roads, but it is disheartening. Antony Bivor quotes a Polish soldier in the Second World War. The enemy always came from the air. The spectacle of the war rapidly became monotonous. Day after day, we saw the same scenes. Civilians running to save themselves from air raids, convoys dispersing, trucks or carts on fire. The smell along the road was unchanging too. It was the smell of dead horses that no one had bothered to bury and that stank to high heaven. We moved only at night and we learned to sleep while marching. Smoking was forbidden out of the fear that the glow of a cigarette could bring down on us the all-powerful Luftwaffe. As for the Soviet invasion, for only 4,000 casualties and in just a few days, the Red Army takes 200,000 square kilometers of land, which includes 5 million Poles, 4.5 million Ukrainians, a million Belarusians, and a million Jews. Most of the Polish troops that have been in the eastern frontier regions are reservists, going through accelerated training. When the Russian invasion began, local commanders asked headquarters what to do. Marshal Edvard Rydz Smigwy first told them to fight, but quickly realized how useless that would be, and then issued a directive for them to negotiate with the Soviets for safe passage to Romania or Hungary. They were only supposed to fight if the enemy fired on them or tried to take their weapons. Well, as it turned out, they have to fight. The Soviets saw them as a hostile force and moved to close the borders. Last week at Grodno, for example, there had been fierce fighting. But by the end of the week, the Polish garrison there decided to evacuate towards Lithuania. Of those left behind, a large number of POWs, notably students and volunteers, were shot by the NKVD, Soviet secret police. One of the cavalry regiments there, the 101st Reserve, do, however, manage to cross the border this week on the 23rd. Also, I mentioned last week that Lvov had surrendered. 
It was a formidable and well-defended town that had been under siege by the Germans. The Russians, though, had arrived the 19th, and Polish General Lagna, in charge, decided to surrender to them over so much opposition it included an attempted mutiny. Under the terms, his officers were to be allowed to cross into Romania or Hungary. Instead, they are rounded up and sent to Starobielsk prison camp and will eventually be murdered at Katyn on Joseph Stalin's orders. Encounters between the German and Russian armies, like at Lvov, and the German retreat according to protocols that give some of their conquered territory to the Russians, go without serious incident. The future of Poland is still up in the air, though. German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop is interested in Germany staking claim to the oil field south of Lublin, which makes Stalin angry. But Stalin soon decides that he could concede Lublin if the USSR eventually gets Lithuania. Von Ribbentrop flies to Moscow to discuss this and the partitioning of Poland. He accepts Stalin's proposal that the new border be along the East Prussian border to the river Narev, then down to the Bug River to the Ruthenian border. This would leave Lvov on the Soviet side. Ethnic Germans in the Soviet regions will be transferred to the German-occupied regions. Stalin also hands over a bunch of German communists. On September 28th, Germany and the USSR sign a Treaty of Friendship partitioning Poland. The Soviets get a bit more land, but the Germans get more people and more industry. Now the Soviet Union will put pressure on the Baltics, and a Soviet-Estonian mutual assistance pact is signed, so the USSR can use bases in Estonia. The idea behind the pact and, spoiler, pact soon offered to Latvia and Lithuania is to ensure Soviet control of the Baltic, especially in the event of German aggression. As for the Germans, Adolf Hitler takes control of lands containing 15 million Poles, 2 million Jews, 1 million ethnic Germans, and 2 million people of other ethnicities. He also takes control of the fortress of Modlin, which surrenders the 28th. Actually, the Germans have had the garrisons at both Modlin and Hell Peninsula under siege. Hell was 20 miles long and just a mile wide, and was fairly easy for its 3,000 defenders to defend. Of course, that also made it a big target for planes, artillery, and naval vessels. In fact, on the 19th, when Hitler moved his headquarters to the Casino Hotel by the Gulf of Danzig, his staff would watch the daily naval bombardment of Hell over breakfast. This was provided by the battleships Schleswig-Holstein and Schlesien. Still though, even as the week ends, little progress has been made by land. As for Modlin, it has four infantry divisions defending it, but is surrounded. The Germans mount a heavy attack the 24th from all sides. The attackers are beaten back, but the Poles suffer heavy casualties and are forced to surrender at the end of the week. And on the 27th, Hitler tells his service chiefs he will make an attack in Western Europe as soon as possible. This is all his idea. The army, for example, is very strongly opposed. They resent his assuming direct control over strategic planning and feel underprepared. But people in Western Europe are very worried about Germany. In Britain, there is by now a fear that German agents have infiltrated society and would soon begin a campaign of sabotage. Thing is, all but a few of such German agents there were had been arrested when the war began. This was a victory for the British, but a secret one, because the Germans did not know this. This week, British intelligence scores another victory. On the 28th, Welshman Arthur Owens, whom German intelligence believe is one of its agents, goes to the Netherlands to meet his superiors. He is, in fact, codenamed Snow and works with British intelligence and convinces the Germans he has set up a fairly extensive spy network in Wales. He is given money and instructions and returns to Britain that night. This is the beginning of the XX, the double cross system. And that ends the week. Warsaw and Modlin fall to the Germans, and while units of the Polish army still manage to escape, the fate of soldier and civilian alike who do not escape looks ever grimmer. And the Germans and the Soviets sign a friendship treaty as they partition their new gains. So who got the best end of the deal between Germany and the USSR? It sure looks like Germany. I mean, in the First World War, the British naval blockade had eventually strangled and starved Germany, but now 
the Germans could get everything they needed to continue to make war. They can get all kinds of stuff from the Soviet Union, like grain and oil, but even beyond that, the Soviets were a conduit for other supplies, especially rubber for things like tires, which Germany was unable to buy abroad. Hitler's plans of large-scale warfare in Western Europe were suddenly a lot more feasible. To learn more about the Soviet claims to Eastern Europe, you can watch our Between Two Wars episode about wars in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states right here. Please join our Time Ghost army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com and support our war effort in making this series. Every dollar counts. See you next time.